Good evening. Can everybody hear me in the far reaches of Greenspun Hall Auditorium? Thanks for coming to what is already our last scholar lecture of the year as, as we get to the close of the year. Uh, we will, uh, we're hard at work on a full slate of uh, scholars and lectures next year. So for those of you, if we have your email, you'll be uh, getting those. If you check out the university calendar, you'll, you'll see our schedule as well. So I hope we see you all back uh, very soon. We've got another group of Brookings scholars visiting us, talking about timely issues. Uh, we'll be dealing next year with everything from higher education and transportation to foreign affairs, obviously, and uh, key economic issues. So we'll have another slate of uh, uh, 10 or 12 lectures that uh, will be taking place right here. Tonight, we're fortunate to have one of our longstanding Brookings colleagues back, Bill Fry. Bill's one of the nation's foremost demographers and the man who makes sense of the US census, if you will. And Bill's been with us uh, ba back to our beginnings, one of the first conferences we had, which led to this volume you've seen me hold up, I dare say, one or two times, a, a book we published with Brookings Press called America's New Swing Region. We're very proud to have some of Bill's work there. Bill's uh, been a demographer for more than 30 years, including his academic work at the University of Michigan, now as a senior fellow at Brookings, incredibly well-published and well-respected. Uh, but you, you will know Bill not just from his academic work, but you will have seen or heard him in every major media publication and outlet in the country on these issues. No one is better experienced or more knowledgeable to tell us about the changing demographics, uh, whether it's relating to age or how it impacts our political process than Bill Fry. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, it's just, it's a, always a pleasure to come back here to Brookings Mountain West and to UNLV. And I want to thank all the people responsible for making this happen. Uh, I guess they told me I was the closer in this seminar series, so I don't know if that means uh, uh, holding the lead or what I have to do in that, in that respect. Um, but I'm pleased to see so many of you here at this very last lecture. You know, when you say that there's a demographer speaking, it doesn't always elicit a great deal of enthusiasm for some reason or another. Uh, and I learned about this a couple of years ago when I got called by someone who wanted me to appear on a radio show about the census. And uh, I said, well, I'll think about it. What's the format? And he said, well, there's going to be two people. It's going to be a demographer, and then there's going to be someone who's lively and engaging. <laughs> and I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I took it the right way, but uh, I did do it. Um, so, so I'll do my best uh, with this. What, what I want to talk about is really the 2010 census. You might think it's old news because it was done three years ago, almost exactly three years ago. Uh, and, uh, but it's takes, it takes a while to figure out what it says. It takes a while to uh, come up with some of the implications of what it means. And, uh, you know, the, the, the changing demographics of the United States affects everything. It really affects everything. It's in the middle of the immigration debate. It's in the middle of what we're doing about Social Security and Medicare. It's in the middle of, uh, you know, all kinds of political decisions that people are making. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I looked at the results of the 2010 census, and I've been doing this for quite a while, as Bill says, I've been in this business way too long. and. Uh, you know, I was really startled. I thought I knew what was going on in this country, and I, you know, had some perspective. Uh, but really, the, the, the sharp, particularly race and ethnic shifts uh, that are going on in this country are phenomenal, and they're going to change things very much in this next century in ways that I don't think we would have known 10, 15 years ago if we were looking at some of these numbers. So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of what I've seen from the census. Now, there, there are really two major forces that are affecting our demography in the United States nationally. One of it, one of it is the rise of new minorities. And by new minorities, I mean Hispanics, Asians, people of mixed race. 
Uh, you know, certainly it's important, the other minority groups who have been here for a long time, and we'll I'll talk a little bit about them, but the growth of these new minorities is really important, and it's shaping the young part of the population, it's shaping our future, uh, but not evenly across the country, but in very different ways and in different places. Um, the other engine of our growth, it's not so much an engine of our national growth, but it's an engine of growth of a particular part of our population, is the aging baby boomers. Everybody has always wanted to know what's going on with the baby boomers. I always call the baby boomers a full employment act for demographers because people are always sort of suspicious. You know, what are they going to do next? You know, what's the deal? They are the Woodstock generation. They're the people who, you know, you know put credit to the limit. Uh, you know, they're in the stock market. They were in the housing market. Now they're turning into their senior years and, um, you know, what's happening to them. Well, they're going to really bubble up our population in those years and in those ages, and it's going to be important for us to take account of what's going on with them. So these are, these are the two major dynamics, which, as I said, kn I knew what was going on until I saw the results of the census, and it really made me feel quite, uh, uh, I was really amazed about some of the results. Well, here, here is uh, the population projections. This isn't really from the census, but the projections that the, the Census Bureau puts out. They just put out these projections uh, in December. They put them out every four or five years, and... Uh, these ones show the white population is uh, going from 69% uh, back in 2000, it's about 64% at the 2010 census, up to only 46%. We're going to tip from a majority minority population uh, around 2043, according to these new, uh, these new projections. Um, the other thing that's going on is we're aging, as I said before. And uh, in, 20, in 20, 2000, we were about 12.4% of the population was age 65 and over. By the time we get to 2050, it'll be about 20%. Actually, we'll be about 20% in 2030 when that last baby boomer turns age 65. And so, uh, you know, this is a heavyweight part of the population and even heavier in some parts of the country rather than others. But in addition, and sort of looking at these two facts, more older people, more minorities, there is, an, there is an interaction that's going on here, and that is the whiter part of the population is disproportionately getting older, and the minority population is disproportionately young. And I think we can see that if we, if we look at these uh, data here. Uh, these are the median ages of different racial ethnic groups. Um, for whites, it's 41. For Hispanics, it's 27. And for people of two or more races, uh, it's only 20. And so you get the sort of picture about the younger part of the population versus the older part of the population. Uh, it's also important to understand that over the course of the, the 2000 to 2010 decade, you see two pie charts there. Uh, the one on the right gives you the racial composition of the increased population between 2000 and 2010. That's the added population. Whites only comprise 8.3% of the new people in the United States between 2000 and 2010. That's immigration, fertility, all of that. The rest of it are minorities. Over half are Hispanics. A uh, good part are Asians. Actually, numerically, there's more Hispanic contribution to gains in this country in the last decade than there were black contributions to gains, even though blacks are still a larger part of the population. Than, Asians. The left, um, the left uh, pie gives you the actual racial composition, but you can see that growth in the United States means minority growth, and that's going to continue to be the case. But I want to get back to the, um, the race and age interaction here, and here what you can see is between 1990 and 2010, the race-ethnic composition of the adult population, which becomes more diverse, goes from 78% down to 67%, but the child population becomes much more diverse, where we have only 54% uh, at the time of the 2010 census of our children, our under age 18 population that is white. So there's this kind of dynamic that's going on that has an age relationship to it. In fact, between 2000 and 2010, there, is absolute, there was an absolute decline of white children, that is white, whites under age 18. More whites, uh, we're moving beyond age 18, then we're being born. So as a result, we have this decline 
in the white child population nationally. The only reason we had a gain in the child population in the United States is because of minorities, and especially new minorities. There was actually a small decline in black children and a small decline in American Indian children. It's only the new minorities that were responsible for the gains in children. And I think this is a slide here that really stunned me when I looked at this. I didn't realize that the white population was aging to such a degree that the proportion of women in their childbearing ages was getting to be small enough and the actual fertility of those women was getting to be small enough that we get this situation where it's the younger part of the population is totally a result of both immigration and the natural increase of the new minority population. Now, this is a national picture and I'll show you later what, how it plays out in some different areas. That's what stunned me. So that's a national focus on kind of the aging and the kind of browning of America, where the browning of America is going from the bottom up of the age distribution, uh, and the older people are just, you know, getting older. So the, the next part of what I want to talk about is what's going on in sort of regionally uh, across different parts of the country. And some people may have heard me talk about this before, but I'm still sticking to this paradigm because I think it still makes sense. We can think of America as to two, three big macro regions. One of them I call melting pot America, the second I call the new Sun Belt, and third, the heartland. And if you look at this map, the bluish green uh, states, those eight states, are melting pot America. Now, they're the six traditional immigration states, California, Texas, uh, and so forth, um, as well as Hawaii and New Mexico. Uh, because they have a high percentage of what I would call new minorities, although I know that uh, Hispanics have been in New Mexico for quite, new Mexico for quite a while. Uh, these are the states uh, that have had the melting going on for a long time, interracial marriages, interracial uh, interactions, and so forth. So uh, nothing new about melting pot in these states. These eight states represent about 40% of the U.S. population, and they're growing about the same rate as the nation as a whole. Uh, which over the, the first decade of the, of the century was about 10 percent, or a little less than 1 percent a year. They're at about that level. Uh, if you look at sort of this, no, this is a little odd. I don't think I can do anything about this. But they have about, they have about 60, <coughs> they have 66 percent of the foreign-born population lives in these states. So if you look at all the foreign population, foreign-born population in the United States, 66 percent of them are living in these states. Only 37 percent of the native-born they also have a disproportionate share of the people who, who speak Spanish at home, a uh, disproportionate share of the people who speak an Asian language at home. So that makes them quite different, even though there's this spreading out of uh, new minorities, which we'll talk about, there's still a very large concentration of these folks in these states. Uh, moving back to the map, the 15 states that are orange here I call the New Sun Belt. Now, in the olden days, you used to think about the Sun Belt as being a lot of the South and a lot of the West and the big Sun Belt states were Florida and Texas and California. Well, that's the old Sun Belt. The new Sun Belt uh, are moving inward from California to the Mountain West, as you well know, and as well as, as, well as in the southeastern part of the United States, these fast-growing states. Uh, I call it the new Sun Belt for another reason, because I sort of make a parallel between these states and what I call suburban regions. Now, we think of the suburbs as rings around cities, uh, people who commute to the core. But, but, but suburbs are also sort of low-density places. They're newly developing places. They're places where the cost of living isn't quite as high as they are in the more urbanized part of the metropolitan area. So if you think of the country this way, these are the, these are the states that are suburban-like. Now, obviously, there are cities in these states as well. But, but broadly, the people have been moving to these states for the last 20 years or 30 years are moving there because of lower cost of living, less congestion. Uh, jobs are moving there also because of the cost of doing business and so forth aren't as, aren't as heavy for them in these places. And, and as a result, these places have been gaining mostly from domestic migration, people moving from other parts of the U.S. rather than from immigration directly. And they also, again, have a more suburban feel. Until recently, uh, they've also been more Republican than Democratic, which in the olden days, is the suburbs were Republican, the cities were Democratic, and, and that's changing, of course. But uh, that's another way of looking at a lot of these states. Um, there is some movement of 
uh, new minorities, and especially for blacks, old minorities, and blacks to the south, old minorities to these states, but it's still pretty much a, 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 a domestic migration movement. And a lot of the new domestic migrants moving to these states are Hispanics, middle class Hispanics, and as well as lower skilled Hispanics moving to these areas. But it, if you look at this chart, there are uh, three sets of bars there. The left hand side shows the first bar is the rate of immigration and the second bar is a negative domestic migration that we apply to the melting pot states. That's not true for each and every one of the melting pot states. Texas gets a lot of domestic migration and to some degree Florida does. But for the most part, you have immigrants being the major growth of these melting pot states. Whereas the new Sun Belt, it's the domestic migration bar that's higher even still in this last decade Last few years, we've had a little bit of a migration lull, which I'll say a few things about later. But for the most part, they're still gaining from domestic migration. Now, the third part of America, which I hadn't talked about yet, is the heartland. It's those 27 other states. Uh, if the melting pot states are growing mostly from immigration and the new sunbelt states are growing mostly from domestic migration, the heartland isn't growing very much from any kind of migration. It's basically uh, a much more stagnant part of the country. Uh, I should have said that the new Sunbelt states are growing at about twice the rate of the national growth level for the last decade. The Heartland states are only growing as a group about half the rate of the national growth level for the last decade. And these are states that not only are getting older, but traditionally are whiter, whiter states, except for some of the southern states uh, in the Deep South. Uh, and our states where we're talking about aging and graying and where baby boomers dominate are largely in these states. So it's, it's a fairly arbitrary split of states in the, in, in the United States is to, to come up with these three regions. And as we'll soon see, uh, there's some sort of distinctions within states. For example, coastal California is more of a melting pot. Uh, the interior part of California is more like a new sunbelt piece of what's going on. Uh, the same as in Florida, uh, the interior part of Florida is more like a new Sun Belt. But for the broad, from a broad point of view, this kind of gives a big picture of how migration patterns are changing the U.S. And I have some, yes, this is a chart I like to look at. This is a somewhat different chart. This, this shows you the percentage of people who were born in the state that they now live in. Uh, the ones who are in the darker states, uh, it's, uh, it's less than, six, uh, sorry, it's greater than 63%. Ones are in the lighter states are less than 63%. What state do you think has the fewest people who were born in the same state, you want to guess? Nevada, yes. It's around 24% of the people uh, born in Nevada, who live in Nevada, were born in Nevada. Whereas Louisiana, uh, even before Katrina, uh, had a, uh, a very high percentage of people born in the same state, but a lot of those states in the industrial Midwest, it, th those states are in the, in the arena of like 75 to 80 percent of the people who live in those states are born in the same state. Well, well what does that mean? Uh, you know, it, some people would say, well, these people love living in their states, they don't want to leave. No, that's not the way to interpret that. These are states that nobody's moving to. That's why the only people that are left are the people who are born in these states. But, but, but still, there's an overlap between uh, the heartland, as I portrayed it before, in these states. People are much more rooted in these areas. They tend to be older, and they have, there's a kind of a different demographic personality in these places than these kind of very fast-growing states like Nevada and, and other states in the Mountain West. And I think you know, there are other indicators you can use to talk about what the heartland is compared to some of the other states. Here are the biggest metropolitan areas that gained migrants, domestic migrants not immigrants, but domestic migrants. And they're all in the new Sun Belt, except, and, and slices of states that should be in the new Sun Belt if they're not, like Tampa and Florida or Riverside and California. Um, Texas is, is a bit of a, of, of a red herring in, in my typology, because it's growing it's drawing people from immigra via immigration and also domestic migration from other parts of the country. But these are all, have been fast growing states, or fast growing metropolitan areas. Uh, the places that have gained the most immigrants are, you could have made this list up 20 years ago and you'd have had most of these same areas on it. Uh, immigration tends to be concentrating people to places where they have friends and family and ties and so forth. And that always stays the same. There aren't as many immigrants going to Los Angeles as there used to be, but it still ranks number two across all of the, uh, across all of the states 
across all of the metropolitan areas. Uh, so there's very little overlap between the domestic migration magnets and the immigrant magnets, Dallas being one and Houston being another. That's in both lists. And then there are the people, the states that had the most domestic out-migration. And there are two types of states like this. One of them are these coastal states that have this middle class flight of people moving to the new Sun Belt, like coastal California and New York City and New Jersey and the Northeast Megalopolis. Um, and then there are other uh, states that have, or, or metropolitan areas, that are just places that the economy is just not doing very well, like Detroit, for example. Uh, so uh, whatever you see, that there's a domestic outmigration from these places to, to the new Sun Belt. They're very distinct areas. Uh, and is, there is an overlap between places that are getting a lot of immigrants and places that are losing domestic migrants. And I think part of that has to do, again, with the social ties of immigrants coming to these places. Uh, they're much more reliant on people that they know for jobs, where domestic migrants are a little bit more footloose, can go to other places if the economy is <coughs> well, and the high cost of living in New York and Los Angeles and so forth. San Francisco is moving them out. Now, having said all that, there still is a dispersion of immigrants to the new Sun Belt. And this has been going on now for two decades, mostly to the southeast and the mountain west. These are the rates of immigrant growth, 22,000 to 2010. Alabama leads 90% gain. Now, most of these states have a relatively small base of foreign-born population, but the growth shows you that they're on the cutting edge of what's going on. Alabama, South Carolina, Tennessee. Uh, North Carolina, South Dakota is even on there. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to inject in here, uh, because I've been mostly looking at, when I looked at these census results uh, from the 2010 census, I had to change my time frame because when you look at a census, you're looking at compared to the earlier census or the earlier several censuses to get a broad sweep of what's going on. There's also this year-to-year -year sweep about what's going on as well. And quite clearly, uh, I'm sure you have seen here in Las Vegas that there's been a downturn in migration, especially to places like Las Vegas, which has picked up a little bit in the last year. Uh, and a lot of it has had to do with the uh, mortgage meltdown. A lot of it's had to do with the recession. And so just nationally, we have one of the lower rates of migration across state lines, across metropolitan areas that we've had since the end of World War II. Uh, and so a lot of the kind of movement to the new Sun Belt that I've been talking about has slowed up a bit. But it's starting to revive, and so I, I foresee it continuing, maybe not at the same levels we saw in 2004 to 2006 or something like that, but certainly continuing to move to these kinds of places. So I just wanted to throw that in. Getting back to the typology, here is a broad racial composition of these three kinds of states. Melting pot states, very racially and ethnically diverse. The new Sun Belt, a little less diverse, many more blacks because we're talking about the South as part of it and then the heartland states, which is the whiter group of states. Um, here are the Hispanic concentrations in counties, the percentage of Hispanics in each of these counties. And it's still very heavily concentrated in the, southeast, the southwest, uh, in Florida, and in major urban areas in the northeast and around Chicago. And then starting to spread out into other places. If we'd have looked at this map 10 years earlier, it wouldn't have been as much moving into the Midwest, as much moving into other parts of the southeast. Uh, but you still see a very heavy concentration of Hispanics in the southwestern part of the United States. Uh, the states with the biggest Hispanic gains uh, are traditional gainers of Hispanics. Arizona's moved up a little bit. North Carolina is now on the list. Uh, but California, Texas, Florida are there right at the top. On the other hand, if you look at Hispanic growth rates, just as we were talking about immigrant growth rates, uh, there you see a lot of these southeastern states with smaller base populations growing rapidly. Some of this has tailed off a little bit in the last few years, but I, again, I foresee it coming back again. Asian concentration, the Asians are a much smaller percentage of the population, a little less than 5%, and so they don't have as much of a swerve over the rest of the country. Uh, a lot of California, some Texas, some northeast corridor areas and Chicago areas and little pieces in different parts of the country. Uh, the biggest gainers, again, are the ones you might expect, California, Texas, New York, New Jersey. Uh, but then the growth rates tend to be in places um, where, in some cases, there's high-tech employment and so forth, where you can see Asians moving. Now, the black population uh, is a, a, a pattern that I want to just take a little time with. As you might expect, 
uh, the highest percentage of blacks live in the south as well as some urban areas in the north and in other parts of the country. But what we've seen as a result of the 2010 census is a continued movement of blacks out of the north, out of the west, and back to the south. Uh, the great migration of the blacks out of the south took off much of the 20th century. Around 1970, there started to be a trickle of blacks back to the south. It really was not big numbers until the 1990s, but that movement has continued. And for the first time in this last decade, there's an absolute loss of blacks in the states of New York, Michigan, Illinois, and California. These are traditional destination states for blacks of the Great Migration out of the South for all those years ago. Uh, and it's, it's moved around. And why is it moving around? Well, you know, I think it has to do with a new generation of young African Americans, more educated, uh, more mobile, more foot, foot loose, uh, wanting to leave places that are, don't have good economies or maybe have high costs of living. The real issue is why are they moving to the South? And the reason is I think it has a lot to do with just a long history in their families and their grandparents and their great grandparents and their aunts and uncles and networks. And there's also something about the South that uh, you know is familiar. Uh, I was once on a talk show uh, and uh, somebody called in and asked, uh, 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 getting people's experiences. Some people asked questions, some wanted to, sh some wanted to share their experiences. And uh, an African-American lady called up and said, you know, I moved from Ohio back to Georgia. And she said, I understand about racial bias and I understand about the history of segregation. But she said, uh, you know, I know what to expect when I move to Georgia. I don't know what to expect if I move to some other parts of the country. So maybe that's part of the reason. There's also, uh, in places like Atlanta, which is far and away the biggest gainer of blacks of any metropolitan area in the country, a very large black middle class population, which is a great place to network if you're a young professional and you want to move to a place like that. So this is something that's going to continue. I know there's a lot of discussion in the country about the new minorities, and I'm talking about them myself. But a very important part of the racial profile of the United States is a continued black presence in the South, and that's going to probably continue even further. Uh, so here are the greatest black gains, even though Atlanta has the biggest metropolitan gain. Florida, Georgia, Texas, and North Carolina are the biggest states in gaining blacks between 2000 and 2010. Now here's the white concentration in the United States, those purple counties. It's the purpler the county, the more whites where the, the really moderately purple and the darker purple, more than 85% of the county's population is white. So should people tell you that we are a diverse country from coast to coast, you can just show them this map, uh, which shows that we have lots of counties that are pretty white. Now, a lot of those counties are fairly small, sparsely populated counties in the Great Plains and such, uh, and then Appalachia and upstate New York, Midwest, and so forth. Uh, but you still see a very high percentage of whites. And again, a lot of these counties are in the heartland states where a lot of young people have left and they're not attracting a lot of the new minorities. So that's part of why you see that there. Uh, whoops. The biggest gaining states for whites are in fact in the south and in the, uh, in the mountain west states that are actually much more diverse. So whites who are moving are not moving to states that are largely white. They're moving to these other states because they've been growing for all kinds of economic reasons. And there, of course, the states that are having domestic migration losses are also having white losses, like California, New York, New Jersey, and so forth. Well, here's a metropolitan look uh, at what's going on. The, there's three clumps of bars which show from 1990 to 2010 the racial composition. On the one hand, large metropolitan areas, those over a half million or so, uh, smaller metropolitan areas, the smaller ones all together, and we call non-metropolitan areas, that's the rest of the country that's not a metropolitan area. And it's clearly this diversity, not only is it moving from the younger part of the age structure up, but it's moving from these very large metropolitan areas first and then to other parts of the country. So in these large metropolitan areas, actually 97% of the growth of the population in large metropolitan areas had to do with minorities. Uh, it was only 92% for the country as a whole. But non-metropolitan areas as a whole are still 80% white, Small metropolitan areas are 72% white. This varies by region, of course, but when you clump it all together, this is what you look at. And it's clear that what the diversity is happening is in, in larger metropolitan areas. 
It also has been happening more in the cities, but is beginning to happen in the, su in the suburbs. It shows the same kind of time trend. And if you look at the suburbs, are now down to, as a whole, for the country as a whole, large, I should say for large metropolitan areas, the suburbs, 65% uh, white. Well, the national population is 64% white, so the suburbs from this perspective is kind of a microcosm of what's going on in the country. The idea of this very white suburban uh, ring around a very diverse city is starting to, starting to change a bit. And if you look at the contributions of different racial groups to the city population as a whole and the suburb population as a whole, you see that green bar sticking up there dominating them all. That's Hispanics. Hispanics are the biggest contribution to gains in cities and the biggest contributions to gains in the suburbs. White loss in cities, uh, white gains in the suburbs, but it's being dwarfed by all these other things that are going on. And uh, there are many more cities where the biggest uh, population in the city is Hispanics rather than blacks than there was before. Now it is true there's a regional aspect to this. This shows city and suburb racial compositions for Los Angeles, uh, melting pot metropolitan area, Atlanta, a new Sunbelt metropolitan area, particularly one that's gaining lots of blacks, as I said, and Detroit, which is a heartland area, which is people are leaving. Uh, but still, uh, you know, you see the suburbs a little bit different than the cities, but, but getting more diverse. Detroit is an example of a city which has had a high level of segregation, not a lot of new movement for any minorities, blacks, Hispanics, or, or anyone. And uh, so that old segregation pattern, which is what you see in terms of the city-suburb comparison, still holds up. It's because there's not a fluid population going on there. But for parts of the country where there's this kind of movement moving into, we see a much more diverse suburban area. And he's, here are the cities with majority-minority populations. 58 out of the 100 metropolitan areas have cities with majority-minority populations. The blue ones are all where the Hispanics are the biggest majority or the biggest minority, and you see California, Texas, and New York metropolitan area. And the red ones are where blacks are the biggest minority, still in much of the south and in some of the industrial cities there. Um, cities with the, the other thing I wanted to talk about, I talked about the blacks moving back to the south. The other issue with blacks, which is new with the 2010 census, is a widespread movement out of cities and into suburbs, uh, a new black flight where you can see, um, I think it was 16 of, the 25, 16 of the 25 cities with the largest black population showed losses. And these are the cities with the biggest losses. Detroit, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C. Places that, um, you know, used to be big gaining places. And again, it's younger people. Uh, they don't want to live back in those segregated neighborhoods anymore. They, they have more freedom of movement and they're moving to the suburbs. And it's not only happening in the north and in the west, but also in the south. Atlanta, Houston, and Dallas all had uh, absolute losses in their city black populations. All the big gains that those southern metropolitan areas are having in blacks are in their suburbs, not in the cities. So this is really something that's quite new, the black flight. It's about four or five decades behind the white flight, but it is happening. And here we see the metropolitan residents living in the suburbs. It's now over 50% for blacks, for Asians, and for Hispanics. Uh, although not nearly as many of those minority groups live in the suburbs as is the case uh, for whites. Okay, that's about the race piece of it, and now I wanted to get into the age aspect of it. And what you see here uh, is the growth of different age groups, uh, starting with a 0 to 14 age group on the left, going up to the 75 and over age group on the white, right. And what you see is a kind of a dividing line between the age 45 and over age groups and the under age 44 age groups. Those old age groups are really growing. I mean, they're really getting up there. The 55 to 64 year old age group grew by 50% in the last decade. And you say, well, how can that happen? The whole country only grew by 10%. Well, it's these old baby boomers just changing their age. But what it does is it increases the size of the senior population, which is gonna continue. If you look at the growth rate of the population age 45 and over, it's 18 times higher than the growth rate of the under 45 population. There's even a decline in the 35 to 44 year old age group, and that's because the baby boomers moved out and a smaller generation moved in. Uh, but we really need, I think this chart tells us more than anything else, that we need to really value the young people in our society and the growth of the youth in our society, which as I said before, is largely due to new minorities in the United States. Uh, I want to talk first about some of these young people. 
Here's the state growth in the child population between 2000 and 2010. Uh, nationally, the growth in the child population is only about 2.8% in 10 years, tiny. But when you look at the country as a whole, all those red states are actually showing declines in their child population. Not in their white child population, in their total, but in their total child population. Uh, and the states in the Mountain West and in the Southeast, the new Sun Belt states in particular, are showing gains in their child population, 5% or more, some a lot. The reason for that is because is over decades, younger people, younger families have moved to these places and had children there. There's been an out-migration from a lot of those other states. So it's really important, given the slow national growth of the child population as a whole, as to whether you're in one of these states that are younging, as I like to say, as opposed to ones that are just aging. And uh, the, these, these blue states are the ones where uh, there's not going to be a decline in the younger part of the population, and aging won't happen as rapidly. The other part of this is because most of these children are minorities. You can see the, the dark brown states there are uh, majority minority states. There's 10 of them. And then there's another 13 uh, where the minorities are at least 40% of the population, like the Carolinas and Virginia and Oklahoma and Colorado and so forth, New York, New Jersey. Uh, so this is quite important to understand. Uh, and it's moving to other states as well. Here's the metropolitan areas with minority white child populations. Not just cities, but metropolitan areas with majority white child populations. California, uh, Arizona, Texas, and so forth. Um, this, another aspect of this is a lot of these children uh, have immigrant parents. In California, over half the children have immigrant parents. Uh, in a lot of those other states, a good part of the children, a third or so, have immigrant parents. Nationally, it's 23%. Uh, a corollary of that is a lot of these children are speaking a language other than English at home. It's 46% in California, 46% of the children in California speak another language other than English at home, but also in Nevada, also in other these, a lot of the Mountain West states, Florida, New York, New Jersey, and so forth. Uh, here's an interesting slide. You can't really read the numbers or the legend, so I'll try to tell you what it says. The, the left side, the two bars show the percentage of people not, spe not speaking English at home, where the blue bar is children and the red bar is adults. 22% of all the children in the United States don't speak English at home, speak another language at home, 20% of adults. But if you go to the right-hand side, which pertains only to the people who don't speak English at home, 17% of those children speak English very well and 11% of the adults speak English very well. So you basically have 17% of the population, I'm sorry, 17%, not of the, I'm confusing the right-hand side, it's of the total population too. 17% of all the children in the United States speak another language at home and speak English very well. In a way, they're bilingual. So that's, that's okay, I think. Uh, and children, and among adults, only about 11% are, are bilingual. So a good portion of those children who speak another language other than English at home uh, are speaking English very well. And studies have shown that it's a second generation of children who speak both languages. By the third generation, mostly are just speaking English alone uh, as we go along. They speak, they speak another language to their parents who might be immigrants. Education by race, ethnicity is a place where we see that Hispanic, uh, especially foreign-born Hispanics, are not doing nearly as well as uh, other groups, and uh, of course Asians stand out. 50% of them have college degrees. These are people age 25 and over uh, on this. Uh, and of course the dropout rates are also high for uh, first generation Hispanics. They're improving over time, but they still lag behind other groups. I'm gonna skip through this and go back to this age chart again and talk about the older part of the population. Uh, here are the median ages for states in the United States. Uh, for Maine, let me get this right, I think it's 41, yeah. Uh, for Maine, it, no, Maine is 43, sorry. Uh, those seven purple states, it's all over 40, and they're mostly in New England, but we have Pennsylvania and, and West Virginia there. Um, it's 29 for Utah. All those yellow states are below age 36. So we really see a divergence, and again, I'm always talking about the younging of certain parts of the population, the parts of those populations as younging have lower median ages. The states where people are leaving have higher median ages. So we really have a breaking apart of what's going on. On the other hand, um, you know, 
all states are showing growth in their older population. It's just that some of them are also showing growth in their younger population. So this is the age 65 and over growth uh, you know, for the country as a whole. Uh, there's a couple of those states where the growth is under 10 percent, but it's, it's still you know, reasonable. And of course, in these new Sunbelt states, it's growing very rapidly. Now, that's an eye-opener for a lot of states that are used to having young people as most of their population to have a rapidly growing older population. At the same time, new younger people are moving in. It's not because there's a lot of retirees moving to these states that they're growing rapidly, although there are some. The main reason they're growing rapidly is these are states that have attracted a lot of people during their working ages and are aging in place. And so this whole wrath of states, Texas all the way up to Idaho and Washington that are colored brown as well as uh, on the East Coast, uh, these are states that are aging because of aging in place for the most part. Arizona, slight exception because it's also for attracting a lot of uh, retirees. Uh, so that's really an important aspect of what's going on here, the, the growth of the older population in what states that you wouldn't think as being older. And here are the, the fastest growing in senior populations metro areas, Raleigh, Austin, Las Vegas, Boise, uh, Atlanta, uh, and so forth, between 2000 and 2010. And this is even before the baby boom. This is between 2000 and 2010. The first baby boomer didn't turn age 65 until 2010. It's even going to be bigger as the baby boomers move, or move into this. And this shows you what I call the young elderly. Since I've moved into this age group, I'm going to think of another term for it. But it's a, <laughs> it's a 65 to 74-year-old age group. Uh, and you can see in this current decade we're in, it's, it's growing like gangbusters. And by uh, the next decade, uh, it'll be the older elderly, people age 75 and over, who are going to be growing most rapidly for the nation as a whole. And here are projections across the US for the 65 and over, over population between 2000 and 2030. 2030 is significant because by then all the baby boomers will have turned age 65. And it looks like almost the same map that we saw before, but this is, they just have higher levels. So those browner states, the older population is, is going to grow by 140 percent or more. And even the, even the states with the lowest growth levels, like West Virginia and Pennsylvania are still going to increase their senior populations by 50 percent or so over that period of time. So the whole country is aging. And uh, just some places are aging faster than others. Places that are aging faster, the ones that already don't have a big senior population, they have places that are aging a little bit slowly already have big senior populations because they lost their younger populations long ago. Um, if you look at these mushroom clouds, this is kind of more demographic um, trivi trivia here, but th these show the rates of growth of the senior population in these three states between 2005 and 2010 up to 2035 and 2040. And those big growth rates, of course, are the baby boomers moving into the 65 and over population between 2010 and 2030. Florida, of course, is attracting a lot of uh, senior migrants. California sort of holding their own. New York is actually losing senior migrants to the south, but they're still growing in their senior population because there's so many boomers aging in place in the state that they're still going to have a big growth in their senior population. Similarly, in the suburbs, here are some metropolitan areas. We're looking at the percentage uh, age 65 and over in the city, which is the red lines, or the suburbs, which is the yellow line, some of them already have a higher percentage of seniors in their suburbs than in their cities. Others are going to get there. Uh, the baby boomers are the first really suburban generation. They were brought up in the suburbs. Their parents were all, you know, came back after World War II or maybe a little bit late. People who were a little bit younger than that. The suburbs were growing rapidly. All these kids were born in the suburbs. They may have spent a few years in the city while they were growing up. But they too went out to the suburbs to have kids and to stabilize their lives. Now they're aging in place in the suburbs. So we're going to have a higher percentage of seniors in the suburbs. Seniors are not only going to be bigger growth in the Sun Belt, but also in the suburbs, two parts of geography you wouldn't normally associate with seniors. Now just a little bit on the demographics of boomers versus their parents. The boomers are going to be very different than their parents as they get into seniors. Cer certainly they're the most educated uh, generation to ever move into the senior ranks. So that's really important. Many of them are going to want to continue to work, even though there may not be no jobs for them, but they're still going to be there ready to work. Um, they're also a, a, a generation where women have been much more involved in the labor force than earlier generations. Those women, too, are going to want to work. 
On the negative side, I don't know if it's negative or not, but they're not as family oriented. They're much, more, much higher levels of divorce, much higher percentages of households that are single adults or when they were younger had uh, one parent only adults, uh, may not have as much save, do not have as much savings as earlier generations did and they don't have as many kids to take care of them when they, when they, uh, when they, when they get older. So there's lots of things going on. The, uh, studies have shown that the boomers really have much more social and economic inequality within the generation uh, than was the case before. I mean, there's some very well-off boomers, don't get me wrong, but there, there have been, uh, there are people who are not doing very well. And you know, this is an issue we read about all the time in terms of not having enough savings. The actual, the kind of pensions that people used to have are going away. And you know, the government trust fund and all of this may have a big impact on these folks. Uh, so it's not all rosy for the boomers, uh, and, but there's going to be a lot of them. Uh, so let's get back to the sort of the major theme, projecting ahead uh, the children by race ethnicity and seniors by race ethnicity. Uh, by 2030, we're going to have 46% of the children are going to be white, still 71% of seniors. Those boomers are going to be around for a long time, no matter what's going on in the younger part of the age distribution. Um, contributions to the labor force. Between uh, 2010 and 2020, there's a, a, a 5 million uh, decline of whites in the of labor force age. I shouldn't say not labor force per se, but labor force age. People, white, people moving beyond age 65 among the white population will be a decline. Uh, and that's all going to be made up by minorities, especially Hispanics. That's why it's really important when we looked at that earlier age chart to see all these aging uh, boomers on the one side and the very small growth in the younger population on the other side that we need to make sure that the Hispanic population and the other minority groups are well suited to the jobs we have. Um, I've called this kind of a cultural generation gap occurring in the United States between a large part of the senior population, many of them baby boomers, many of them were, grew up in an era where there weren't a lot of immigrants in the United States. Uh, people who grew up in the 50s like I did in the 60s, immigration was at an all-time low during those years. I mean, you knew people who were, you know, older people who moved in, who, who moved across uh, the ocean in uh, the early part of the 20th century. But current immigrants were not a big part of the United States back then. Uh, and and, and the, great, the biggest minority group among the people age 45 and over are African Americans, not Hispanics, not Asians. When you look at the under 35, or under 45 part of the population, there you have the big growth in the Hispanic population. So the kind of issues that come up about uh, how to slice the government pie in terms of whose needs are going to come along, it's going to be quite difficult. We already see it coming up in terms of how we're going to deal with Medicare, how we're going to deal with Social Security. Uh, younger part of the population is very interested in their children and good educations and getting into the middle class and all of that. Uh, and so it, it's, it's changing, uh, I think, the politics of this a little bit and depends on where you live. In California, uh, even in California, you have a, a fairly high percentage of whites in those older years compared to the younger part of the population. And in Minnesota, well, not quite so much. It's still pretty white in all those ages there. And uh, Arizona, um, you know, is a place where the new minority population and the growth in that new minority population is relatively recent if you compare it to, say, California or some other states. And of course, Arizona, in addition, attracts a lot of white seniors, and so there is a rather sharp. And all the kinds of measures of what I call the cultural generation gap or the racial generation gap, Arizona always comes out first, or Phoenix always comes out first. If you look at the percentage of whites in the older population versus the percentage of whites in the younger population, and it's big in a lot of the Mountain West and big in some of the South, as you can see there. Um, here's state growth between 2000 and 2010, and uh, you can see the Mountain West states are doing pretty well, so is, so is Texas, so is a lot of the West. And if you translate that into changes in congressional seats based on the 2010 census, it's a lot of the new Sun Belt uh, that's gaining those seats. Uh, Texas, of course, continued to gain seats during that, during that period in Florida, and of course a lot of the Northeast is losing. Uh, and if you look at the Hispanic share of the population in 2010, there's somewhat of a correlation between where the new seats are coming and where the Hispanic population is raising, is, is gaining. Here's the Hispanic percent of growth in states that gained seats from the 2010 census. 63% uh, 
uh, Texas, uh, Hispanics accounted for 63% of the growth in Texas, which gained four new seats in Congress, 51% in Florida, which gained two new seats in Congress, 48% in Nevada, uh, and uh, even in Utah, 26%. Hispanics accounted for 26% in Utah's population. So you see that it's important politically to think about um, you know, where Hispanics are living and what their needs are going to be, and not just Hispanics, but other new minorities which are growing just as rapidly in the country. But then there are all these kind of older a aging baby boomers. So this has a lot of impacts on a lot of things. So I'm going to stop here and, and take some questions. I think uh, I've given enough of an overview of this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I think it, that's a very, very interesting talk. And uh, I think as, as we move forward, you know, we, we have to find ways to produce equal to what we consume so we can reach balance and sustainability. So it's going to be, and I know that a lot of our cities are, are kind of losing, or I'm, that's part of my, it seems like the cities are losing that, but it's going to be interesting too with the new energy development, like, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana kept showing up as no change, but it's really igniting, so to speak, with the energy changes. So. What about some of the new uh, economic factors? It looks like they're really going to have some strong impact on the next one, the next census. Well, it's true. I mean, if we looked at this census, if we'd have taken this census, say, in 2007 rather than 2010, you'd see a very different, rea somewhat different allocation of congressional seats. California might have lost a seat if we'd have taken the census then, if people still kept going from California to Nevada and to Arizona and to all these states. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe Texas wouldn't have done so, so well over that period of time. And, and so what I'm saying is this growth of the new Sun Belt, for a lot of it's real estate, a lot of it is other kinds of industries that, that happen to be there, something you wouldn't have predicted 15 or 20 years ago. It's, 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 it's happened, it's kind of the, the, now the pioneering era, area of the, popular, of the part of the United States. People first went west, then they went south, now they're going in. So um, North Dakota, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, they do have a lot of energy there. And it's, it's proof that if you have a good economy, people will move there no matter where it is. But, but it's, <laughs> uh, you know, I can't say where that's going to be. But I certainly say that there's going to be some change when we look at these numbers going down the road. Yeah. When, when you were uh, talking about the difference between the senior population and the children population, the, what number defined the children population? Less than 35 or less than? Under 18. Under 18. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the I mean, we, were we defined as 65 plus as opposed yeah, to that's correct. under 18. That's okay. correct. But the big, as I showed, the bigger growth is these baby boomers moving beyond age, age 45. And then, you know, the baby boomlet has a little bit of growth for some of those younger years. But what happened is the boomlet moved out of the under 18 category when, in this last census, and there weren't enough at least white young people to make up the difference. It was last May, I think, a year ago, May, where the, the, the census showed that the, the first cohort of births was what was majority minority in the United States. And that's, that's going to continue. Yeah. Um, in the slide uh, that talked about people um, being born and staying in the same state, uh, why was the 63% the cutoff? Um, I was just arbitrary. I mean, I could have done all kinds of things, but I just, I just did that as an arbitrary. It, it's actually, I think, 35% for the nation as a whole, but I wanted to make it a high level to be, to be able to show where there's a, there's a lot of people living in those states. Uh, it looks like it, it kind of divided it into halvesies. That's yeah, I mean, I, I took that into account when I did that. I wanted to show the places where things were really, people really kind of rooted. Uh, you know, I could have made another sliver of states where Las Vegas and maybe six or seven other states were like really turbulent with the population. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't do that. Yeah. yeah. So for your distinction between city and suburb, you, you mainly use the county boundaries for those, right? Well, no, we did, um, you know, the census has kind of a complicated classification of cities and suburbs. It used to be when you went to a city uh, like the Detroit metropolitan area and say, well, the city of Detroit's a city and everything else is a suburb. But now it's a little bit more complicated. They take into account commuting and uh, density and these kinds of things. So there's a couple of the suburbs that are actually thought of as the, the Census Bureau thinks of as a city. We at Brookings, the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program, have redone what the census did. 
to make it a little bit more like you would normally think of it. Uh, so um, if it's a metropolitan area, it usually has up to three cities with over 100,000 population, which are sort of clustered together, uh, like Los Angeles, Long Beach, for example, is, is an example of that. But it's the metropolitan area as the Census Bureau defines it, and the cities are mostly what you think of as the city, but we might have added a small sort of an interior suburb that's, that's very urban as part of it. I think it's the simplest way I can. I can it's say. quite interesting. Uh, yesterday we had David Plain from University of Arizona, and he talked about. I mean, he recently published it uh, together with the census, uh, uh, the census report about 2010 data with the metropolitan uh, demographic features. Mm -hmm. Interesting part was, you know, the group of uh, researchers are talking about this kind of you know, the, uh, empirical evidence showing this great inversion to the city center of those populations. Especially, they didn't follow any definition by census or any uh, uh, county boundary, rather. They drew this uh, huge uh, uh, boundary from the city hall within two mile radius and three mile radius. And some of those big uh, MSAs, metropolitan areas like Chicago, is showing the great inversion, mm -hmm. difference for the inversion of those uh, empty nesters, especially, show different uh, by ages. And it was not actually captured from your, that's why I ask you how right. you define this city and survey. Right, there are a lot of definitional issues. And I mean, there, it is an important issue that people talk about. Uh, is there a return to the city? Who's moving back to the city? It's gonna be empty nesters, are there gonna be singles who not only are gonna stay in the city while they're single, but stay there after they have kids, which is something typically people haven't done. And, I, and my answer to that is always, it depends on the city. Uh, there are cities that are very attractive places to live and uh, they will be able to get some of those people, but there, there's, there's a lot of cities that are not gonna be able to make that kind of inversion going on. So I think that's, you know, that's the deal. But what, what you were talking about is not the city per se, but sort of a, near the downtown area, which is kind of slightly circumscribed in some ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my question sort of related to that. Do you have any sense of what happens when you break the suburbs into inner ring and outer ring? Are there separate racial and age demographics, or is it sort of the same? No, it's, it, it, it's more complicated, and, it, and it's, 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 um, it's difficult to do because if you go through all of the census uh, websites, uh, I used to say volumes, but now you have to go to the websites and look at all the tables they produce, you will never anywhere see the word suburb. Okay, they, they talk about counties, they talk about cities, they talk about metropolitan areas. For some reason, uh, they've decided never to classify anything as a suburb. It's only the rest of us on the outside that, that uh, sort of make our own rules about what the suburbs are. And for this analysis, I simply did, as you saw, the, the whole rest of the metropolitan area that's, not out, not out, that's outside the city. Uh, people can do fine-grained analyses of small communities, uh, inner suburbs, outer suburbs. What we did at Brookings, we did something cruder. We looked at counties. Now, counties out here in the West are huge, okay? But if you look at counties in the, in the uh, Atlanta metropolitan area, I don't know how many they have, 20 or 30 counties in the metropolitan area, similarly for the New York and Washington metropolitan area. Then you find that when you get to the outer parts of the suburbs, it's mostly white. It's mostly uh, what we used to call exurbs, basically. I mean, they're, they're also becoming a little more diverse, but, but it's the inner suburbs and the middle suburbs that are getting a lot of this diversity compared to the outer suburbs uh, for the most part. Yeah. Yes? Do you break down uh, the Asian population into different subgroups? So like, uh, what's the greatest increase and in where in the country, let's say Filipino or um, Chinese or Japanese, so forth? Yeah, it's, I mean, there's like seven or eight sort of major Asian nationality groups. I mean, there's a lot of them, but there's seven or eight that are the major ones. Uh, numerically, the biggest gaining uh, Asian groups in the United uh, States are, are both Chinese and Asian Indians. But in terms of the, the spread out to different parts of the country, by far Asian Indians are leading the way in a lot of these different, sorry to put my hand up here, I have a light in my face. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, they're, they're one of the biggest groups, but they're also, and also one of the biggest gaining groups, but in terms of dispersion, they're going to most places and are taking the biggest part of the Asian gains in different parts of the country. And I think it may be that, you know, 
some of them are high tech, some of them are, are entrepreneurial, but whatever reason, they're less clustered than a lot of the other Asian groups. I think that's, that's what I got out of looking this stuff. I wrote a report on this, but I don't remember all the statistics in it, so we can give you a copy. Yeah. Or, pardon me? Were there any surprises where income is? I, yeah, I, I generally don't do income, so I'm, I'm, uh, I try to leave the economists play around with income. Uh, but I can say that because of the, uh, you know, the Great Recession, it has really had an impact on a lot of these patterns. Fewer people are moving to the suburbs, especially to the exurbs, and of course, as you felt here in Las Vegas and a lot of places like Phoenix and Orlando and other parts of the country, the migration patterns have just you know, really been stalled for a while. Now coming back a little bit, and some of that has to do with, uh, obviously, the ability to get mortgages, the ability to get jobs, and so forth. But uh, in terms of, a lot of my colleagues at Brookings do a lot of good work on income, but I don't usually touch that very much. Yeah? Are the <coughs> slides or uh, the data available on the website, or? Uh, sure, I, Bill can. Huh? Make that available, I, I guess. I didn't pay you to ask that question. <laughs> As we speak, the, uh, Bill's PowerPoint is up on our website. So if you go to the Brookings Mountain West website at UNLV and look at our past lectures, although we aren't quite past yet, we're tinkering with the time continuum here, but under past lectures, you'll see Bill's lecture and you can click on the PowerPoint to it. In a couple days, the actual lecture itself will be up there as well. Any a last question? Bill will be around for a few minutes if you'd like to talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you all for coming. A lot of information here for which we thank you, sir. And consider this as you're thinking about locally our own politicians dealing with the, the myriad of policy issues they are and how this factors in to both Las Vegas and Nevada. And keep this stuff in mind as we bring our Brookings colleagues through in the, in the next year and the, as Bill said, these kind of demographics hit on all the policy issues that, that we deal with at Brookings. So we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, sir. Sure. That was great. I know that's a very hard